continue in our worship by celebrating the power of a story. You see, everyone in this room has a story. We have different backgrounds. We come from different families, different experiences, different cultures. But to God, every story in this room is important. And because it's important to him, you are welcome with your story, your experience in this room. You see, God is in the details of our stories. And over the last couple of weeks, our rooted students have, have gone through a journey embracing the fact that God steps in the midst of your story no matter how broken and no matter where you are in your life. In scripture, we see Jesus stepping into stories like the woman with the issue of blood or the man who was sitting by the highway begging because he could not see or maybe the woman at the well, God was in the details, meeting them in the midst of their story. Today you may be sitting here and identifying with those stories, broken, ashamed, but I want you to know that God is not intimidated by your story. He steps right in the midst of it. Do you believe that church? So we continue to worship him, celebrating the fact that he's in the midst of our story.
house worshiping together today. <laughs> Welcome to Mariners Church. My name is Darius and I'm so excited to see your faces. You may be seated. All right. Well, good morning. Good morning. My name is Jared. I am the rooted pastor around here. Are we feeling okay? Yeah. All right. Hey, last night we had 
one of the most incredible Saturday nights and you all missed it. Because you come to church at 11, Saturdays are where it's at, you guys. Last night we had the Rooted Celebration in our Saturday night service. Now let me just give you a glimpse of what it looked like. The entire floor was filled with Rooted graduates. Every single seat of people pumped up on what God has done in their life over the last 10 weeks. Now, has anyone here graduated from Rooted already? Okay. Yeah, now, you missed last night. The energy was insane, all right? So you want to be here for Saturdays because they are really that awesome. But Rooted, I love it so much because we got to witness last night what God, what only God can do, he has done through so many people at our church. We felt the freedom that God has brought in so many people's lives just here last night. You saw the cardboard testimonies. You saw those stories that stood up here just a few moments ago. A small glimpse into the freedom that God brought. A small glimpse into the new purpose that people has found. A small glimpse into the awakened love for God, the, the love that God has for them so that they can share that love for others. And we want this for you. And so if you're new at our church and you don't know what Root it is, we have a table outside. Come visit me. Um, we'd love to get you signed up. We start up on April 16th. And it's going to be an incredible ride where we will understand what does it mean to connect with God the church and to our purpose and it really is the best thing we got going and so I'd love for you guys to check that out. Now if you are new and you're not quite ready to sign up for Rooted, that's okay. We have a welcome center as well. We'd love to get to know you. We'd love to hear a little bit about your story and then help you find your next step here at our church. So you can go right outside these doors and hang a left. We have a great team of people that would love to, to meet you um, after this service. Now, we have a lot of amazing things going on here at Mariners, and I want to call your attention just to two of those things. The first is, we got some high school students in the room. Can we say what's up, high school students? So fun. Um, We've been, we've been loving having our high school students in the Sunday morning service, and they also have a Sunday night uh, service. They have a youth night every Sunday night that has been insane, right? Has it been good? Has it been fun? Yeah. So if you're a high school student, you're not sitting in this section or you're not going to Sunday nights, you need to be there. And I'm going to just say tonight's going to be one of the better ones because we've got Nick Foles hanging out at Sunday night tonight. Yeah, he's going to be talking about what does it feel like to be a Super Bowl MVP. I know what it feels like. It feels amazing, right? Just kidding. I have no clue. I have no clue what that feels like. But Nick's a great, uh, he's a great guy. Him and his wife, Tori, they're, they're wonderful people at our church. And he has a heart for high school students. And so he's going to be hanging out there tonight um, so that he can start talking about what does it look like to really understand God's calling in our life and then to live with purpose. And so if you have a high school student, bring him tonight. And then what you can do is uh, drop your son or daughter off. And then we've got a parent night going on in the cafe. Because what we don't want is a bunch of da like dads or adult men hanging around the back so they can see what a Super Bowl MVP looks like. All right? It's weird and it's creepy. So don't go there. All right? High school students are there. But if you are a parent of, come to the cafe. We'd love to spend some time with you guys as well. Next Saturday night, we have a global celebration night. Yeah, we're going to be spending some time hearing from our global partners and the, the ministries that they have all around the world. We're going to eat some global food, and we are going to pray for them. And so if that's something that interests you, we'd love for you to come out next Saturday so that you can be a part of this global party that God is throwing. Um, and then continue on in Saturday nights, because as I've said, it really is the service that we love most. We have so much fun at that. I know it's hard to hear that, because here we are at 11, and you're like, you love them more than us? Kind of, a little bit. So come on and check it out. Come see what we've got going on over there. And the last thing I want to talk about is giving. We are a generous church. We believe that as we are learning what it means to follow Jesus, that we would be people who would grow in our generosity. Because it comes from an acknowledgement that we are not the owners of all the things that we have. In fact, if you've been through Rooted, you know that one of the main things that we want to talk about is how God is the owner of all things, and he has generously given to us. Which means if God is the owner... We are the stewards, and we want to be people who acknowledge that what I have has been given to me, and I want to be as generous with what I have been given in the way that it was given to me. If it was given generously to me, I want to give generously as well. And so 
giving is a thing that we do around here, and it, it is um, oft, often done online. Many of us give online. You can find information for that on our website. Um, we also have offering boxes located at all of the exits today because this is about growing in our trust and our relationship with God, wanting to continually pursue what does it mean to follow Jesus, and we believe that being consistently generous is one of those ways. Now, we're really excited that you guys are here this morning as we continue the best chapter ever. Can we show Eric some love as we continue on in this series? Thank you, Jared. All right, we're going to be in Romans chapter 8. If you have your Bible, go ahead and turn to Romans chapter 8. If you don't have a Bible, all of the passages that we're going to study are in the bulletin that you were handed when you came in. So big game tonight. UCI is going to win. They're going to win tonight and go, against, and go into the Sweet 16. That is, that is the hope. So if you're a UCI grad or a UCI student, we are excited. This is the first victory for us. Uh, they're our neighbors right across the street, and so it's a big, it's a big deal. Some of you have wondered and some of you have asked, um, hey, why does Eric quote hip-hop artists and other artists when he's doing his sermon? It kind of throws me for a loop. I mean, he's quoting the Apostle Paul in Romans 8. Then he drops a C.S. Lewis or a Dietrich Bonhoeffer quote, you know, an old dead theologian. And then all of a sudden there's a rapper. I mean, what is he doing? Why does he do that? And I want to tell you why before I quote a whole bunch this morning. I want to tell you why. So... <laughs> Aristotle, centuries ago, said this, that art imitates life. And many have picked up on Aristotle's quote. And basically to say, if you want to understand a culture, if you want to understand what the hopes and dreams, but also the pain and the remorse and the brokenness of a culture, if you will look at the art, if you will look at the lyrics of artists, if you will look at the plays and the novels that are written and crafted during a time period, you will understand life in that culture because art imitates life. So if Aristotle walked here today, and he wrote centuries ago and, and lectured centuries ago, but if he wrote today, I have wondered often, what would he think of our culture? What would he think of our artists and our plays and our novels, of what it says about the hopes and the pain and the struggles that people around us have. Because as Christians, here's what we wanna do. Here's what I wanna do as I, as I teach God's word. I wanna take the timeless truth of God's word and the grace of Jesus and apply it to people in the middle of their pain, in the middle of their brokenness. So when I look at lyrics of artists, I'm understanding that those lyrics represent the pain in a culture. They represent the brokenness among us. And so what would Aristotle think? Well, you're going to see several lyrics this morning that is a common thread, a common theme throughout music, and it transcends generations. So you're going to see some lyrics from different generations, and it transcends genre. So it's not about a specific genre or a specific generation, and a common theme that you're going to see this morning is a longing that artists have for a relationship with their father or the pain and the, the regret and the remorse and the brokenness of not having a relationship with their father. And what does this teach us? What does this show us about the brokenness in our lives and about what we really long for? So if you're here and you're a Christian or you're here and you're not yet a Christian, you're checking out the Christian faith, this actually shows us a lot about how God created us. He created us with a longing for a father. And we're going to see why that is this morning. But here's, here's some of the lyrics. John Lennon in Mother, he, he crafted this. Father, you left me, but I never left you. I needed you, but you didn't need me. Logic in the, his song, Till the End, he writes, Every day, boy, I thank the Lord. I got a lot of problems but could have more. Wish I spoke to my dad more, my jeweler less. Eminem in his song, Headlights, this is devastatingly sad. One thing I never asked was where my deadbeat dad was. I guess he had trouble keeping up with every address, but I'd have flipped every mattress, every rock and desert cactus on a collection of maps and followed my kids to the edge of the atlas. Essentially saying how my dad treated me, I would never treat my children that way. Never. Everclear in their song, Dear Father, and some of you grew up listening to Everclear, 
Father of mine, take me back to the day when I was still your golden boy. Back before you went away, then he walked away. Daddy gave me a name, then he walked away. The brokenness, the longing for a relationship with our earthly father. Justin Bieber, in his hit song, Where Are You Now?, he said that that was originally written about a time in his life when his father was distant from him and he wondered, where are you? So all of us have been created with this longing for our earthly father. And why is this? Well, here's what Christians believe. Here's what the scripture teaches us, that our God created us And he created us with this longing for a relationship with himself. So basically, God created you, and God created you for himself, and that you will never be satisfied and never be happy and never be fulfilled until you have a relationship with him. And because God created you for himself, the image that he gives us throughout Scripture is that he is or wants to be your father. He wants to be your dad. So the longing that you have for an earthly father, maybe you just thought it was only about the longing for an earthly father. It's actually a much bigger longing. The father you ultimately need is our heavenly father. Now, all of us long for an earthly father, but the father we really need, the father that will ultimately satisfy and make us happy and bring us life is the relationship with our heavenly father. Now, if you were the enemy, if you were Satan and you wanted to mess up humanity's understanding of God, what would you do? If you were the enemy and you wanted to mess with humanity's view of God, Who would you attack? Fathers, dads. It's no accident that fatherlessness and struggles with our earthly fathers has plagued humanity because the enemy knows if he can get us to not want a relationship with an earthly father, then we'll struggle to have a relationship with our heavenly father. And so if you're here, no matter your background, if, if you've been blessed like I have been with a great earthly father, or maybe there's a lot of pain with you every time, even I mention the word father, even if that's painful for you, there's really good news. All of us have this in common. We're not going to be satisfied and quenched until we have a relationship with our heavenly father. And the Christian faith is ultimately about us seeing him as our perfect dad, our perfect father. J.I. Packer, in his famous book, Knowing God, he said this, what is a Christian? What is a Christian? The question can be answered in many ways, but the richest answer I know is that a Christian is one who has God as father. If you want to judge how well a person understands Christianity, find out how much he makes of the thought of being God's child and having God as his father. How big of a deal is it to you that God is your father? Packer says that's how you know if you really get this, if you really understand the Christian faith. So verse 14 of Romans 8. If you're new here, we're so glad you're here. We've been walking through the book or the the chapter of Romans 8. For the last several weeks, we're in week three, and we've been going through every single verse. And today, we're going to look at four verses. I'm going to read all four of them, and then I'm going to give us one thought from each of the verses. uh, Here we are, verse 14. For all those led by God's Spirit are God's sons. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. Instead, you received the spirit of adoption by, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father, the Spirit himself testifies together with our spirit that we are God's children, and if children, also heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. I want you to notice the phrase, and if you have your Bible, you may want to underline this phrase. There's so many incredible words just in this passage right here. But notice the phrase, we received the spirit of adoption. We received the spirit of adoption. This one phrase, remember last week we talked about how when you became a Christian, Holy Spirit moved in. You received the spirit 
And that spirit is, the Holy Spirit is the spirit of adoption. And Paul wrote this, he was the author of this text to Christians who lived in the city of Rome. And when they read that phrase, spirit of adoption, they understood exactly what the apostle Paul was talking about. Because in the Roman culture, in Rome, it was very common for orphans to wander the street and they hoped that somebody would adopt them. In the Roman culture, it was very common for parents to just discard their kids, for dads to say, I don't want this child to be my son, or I don't want this child to be my daughter. And if you were an orphan, you longed, obviously, for someone to come along and adopt you and choose you and select you and bring you into his family. And in Rome, if you were a wealthy individual who didn't have a son, who didn't have an heir, you would look for, for an orphan child to bring into your family, to set your affection on. And if you were adopted in the Roman culture, it was beautiful. Essentially, all of your debts were forgiven. Everything in your past, everything was gone. It, is, it was as if you were born again. You were brought into this family and you were now an heir of this wealthy man who adopted you. Your name was changed. Everything about you was different. So if you were an orphan living in Rome, wandering the streets, selling yourself into slavery to eat and to take care of yourself, you dreamed and prayed that somebody would adopt you. And the Apostle Paul is saying, this is exactly what happened to you when you received the Spirit. You received the Spirit of adoption, that God looked at you and He loved you and He changed you and He gave you His name and you became His heir. He went after you and you received Him and you now are His adopted son and His adopted daughter. In the Roman culture, being an adopted child was even better than being a biological child. Because if you were a biological child in the Roman culture, you could be discarded. But if you were adopted, that meant you never were going to be discarded. Because the father went after you and selected you and paid for you and changed your name and made you his and made you his heir. It was a bigger deal to be adopted in the Roman culture than to have a biological parent. And so when the apostle Paul says, you receive the spirit of adoption, this is a mic drop moment in Romans chapter 8. I mean, he's saying to us Christians, we were spiritual orphans, and God loved us, and we received him. We received the spirit of adoption. So we did not achieve the spirit of adoption. We received the spirit of adoption. When God adopted you and made you his son, made you his daughter, it didn't happen on accident. It wasn't as if you became a Christian and God was like, whoa, I did not think that was going to happen. <laughs> wasn't expecting that one. Wasn't thinking she was going to follow me. Wasn't thinking that he was going to become a believer. No, when God adopted you, you didn't achieve adoption. You received it. He did not hold tryouts. You didn't show up one day and try out to be his child. You didn't um, show up to a casting call and, and give your best and flag God down and show him how awesome you were. And then he said, fine, you can be my kid. That's not how it happened. He didn't peruse LinkedIn and see how great everything in your life is because everybody's awesome on LinkedIn. He didn't peruse LinkedIn and choose you that way. No, when you were an orphan, he pursued you and set his affection on you and loved you, you receive the spirit of adoption. On YouTube now, there is a popular genre, subgenre on YouTube of adoption videos. And this subgenre is children who are bringing papers to the man who has taken care of them, who has been as a father to them, and they're wanting it to be formalized. They're wanting it to be official. They're wanting this father figure to formalize and make the adoption official. I officially want to be your son. I officially want to be your daughter. And so our team put together some of the best clips. Take a look. You have to read this out loud, okay? Are you serious? Yes. Is this going to make me cry? No. <laughs> Just read it. You, and I cannot imagine not having you in my life. I'm so grateful to be able to call you dad. Um, 
You're probably wondering what this letter is for. <laughs> Adoption papers. For me to adopt Julie. Right. Really? Well, read it to us then. Wow, it's oh, it's um, it's a petition for adoption. Wow. Very nice. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's wonderful. Wow. wow. Yeah, I've been wanting to do that for up. Okay. <laughs> 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 I said, and you want to adopt me? <laughs> 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 Where did you get that? Oh, do you? Of course I do. So good. It is a bit dusty in here this morning. I'll tell you what. I'm not crying, you're crying. Um, <clears throat> it's a beautiful picture. Because when you became a Christian, God was overjoyed to be your father. He was overjoyed that you would be his son and be his daughter. He adopted you. And you receive the spirit of adoption. It is a beautiful picture of what it means to be his. So what does it mean for me? What does it mean for you? There's four things. If you want to take notes, and these four come just from this verse. Number one, it means that he leads you. He leads you. First, look at verse 14. The scripture says, for all those led by God's spirit are God's sons. Now, if you're a woman here, and you're thinking, wait a second, am I included? Because it just says, for all those led by God's Spirit or God's sons. Maybe you're new to the faith and you're wondering, God, this feels a little bit um, male-dominated, a little patriarch. I don't, I don't like that it's just about the guys. But actually, the reverse is true in this passage. The Apostle Paul was writing in a culture where it was understood that only the sons would receive the inheritance. And in a subversive way, he says to everybody living in Rome that everyone who is led by God's spirit gets treated as God's sons. So, so women, he was actually saying, he wasn't excluding women, he was including women, saying everyone who is led by God's spirit gets everything from the Father. All who are led by God's spirits gets tr get treated that way. This was inclusive of women. So the women in the room said... Thank you for all seven of you understanding what I just said. <laughs> this was actually very affirming of women. And so in this passage, this, this text says that if we're a Christian, we are the people who are led by His Spirit. So what does it mean to be a Christian? It means that I am led by Him. It doesn't mean that I, fought, that I lead and Jesus follows me around. And some of us have misunderstood the Christian faith, as if the Christian faith is a way for God to help you live your life. I'm going to show up at church because here's my plans for life, and I'm going to ask God to bless my plans for my life. Come on, Jesus, follow me around. Hey, Jesus, can you fix that problem? Um, Jesus, I want to go, come over here, Jesus. Jesus, fix this, fix this. That's not at all what the Christian faith is about. The Christian faith isn't us convincing Jesus to follow us around. 
The Christian faith is us following him. All of us who are led by God's spirit, we are the ones who are his sons and his daughters. And if we're not led by his spirit, then we aren't his kids. His kids are led by him. His kids follow him. I've had the opportunity, and it's been so amazing uh, as a dad to lead both of my kids, Eden, who's 11, and Evie, who's nine. I was there when both of them, at different times, and it was just me and them on a trip, when both of them said, I believe and I want to follow Jesus. And so it was, it was an amazing time. It, with, it, both times I was traveling, speaking, and I checked the kids out of school and took them with me on two different occasions. And with Eden, we had spent so much time having conversations. And then one night in a hotel, she's asking questions about how do I become a Christian? How do I ask Jesus to forgive me? How does he change me? And so she knelt down at the bed in the hotel room and she prayed and asked Jesus to change her and forgive her. And it was, it was just amazing to watch. And then with Evie, about a year later, her and I were, were driving. I had been speaking somewhere. We actually were driving back to Nashville where we lived and we stopped at the Chick-fil-A in Bowling Green, Kentucky. This conversion story is sponsored by Chick-fil-A. <laughs> so we went through the drive through at Chick-fil-A and she received the chicken nuggets and then talked about receiving Jesus. That's pretty much how it happened. <laughs> and so she was asking questions about how do, how, do I, how do I know, how do I know if Jesus forgives me and how do I become a Christian and how does he change me? And I explained the gospel to her, explained the good news. And, and I said, Evie, more than you want to become a Christian, more than you want to be forgiven, he longs to forgive you and make you his. He longs to be your father, and he's the perfect father. I'm not the perfect father, but he's the perfect father. And she was in the back seat, and she just started praying, and it was beautiful. Jesus, change my heart. I want to be your daughter. Make me yours. It was just, it was amazing. And so people have asked me since then, parents have asked me, hey, how do I know if it was real? Eric, how did you know if they were ready? How did you know if, if they're sincere? How do you know if it's legit? And here's my answer every time. Time will tell. Time will tell. Well, Eric, what do you mean time will tell? Time will tell because the scripture says here that the kids of God, the children of God are those who are led by the spirit of God. And so time will tell. I'll be able to see, you'll be able to see, they'll be able to see if in the trajectory of their life, it is marked by being someone who follows God, not someone who tries to get God to follow them. And so being a child of God is someone who is led by the Spirit of God. All right, here's number two. He hears you. So not only does he lead you, but he hears you. Look at the next verse, verse 15. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. So there's two ways in this passage to relate to God. One is I'm his slave, he's a master. The other is he's my dad, he's my father. You didn't receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. Instead, you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. We cry out, Abba, Father. Now, this was amazing when this was first written because those who read this letter for the first time, when they saw the word Abba, they knew that the Apostle Paul was about to make this incredible statement. And here's why. Romans chapter 8, all of it is written in Koine Greek. It's written in Greek. It, we read it in English, but it's initially written in Greek, except for one word, the word Abba. And you may want to circle that word because it's a powerful word in Romans chapter 8. This one word wasn't written in Greek. This is an Aramaic word, and it's a word that Jesus used. So when the Apostle Paul is writing Romans chapter 8, it's all in Greek, and then he gets to this one word, and he says, okay, here's how we can cry out to the Father. We can use Abba. And why is this a powerful word? Because this is the same word that Jesus used while he walked this earth to call the Father Abba. So when Jesus walked this earth, his relationship with God the Father, he used this word over and over again. He used the word Abba, which was scandalous in the culture. 
Because Jesus stepped into a Jewish culture in which the Jews believed that God was an over there God, a far away distant God. He's too holy and he's too pure for us to even write down his name. In fact, when they wrote his name, they would leave the, vol- the vowels off of his name because he's too, we could never be close. He's too holy. He's too transcendent. He's too far away from us. And then Jesus comes. And Jesus starts calling God Abba, which is a very intimate term, a very personal term for father. It's dad. So this distant, far away God that everyone in the culture believed, there's no way I could be close to him. Jesus shows up and he starts calling God, he's my Abba, he's my dad, he's my father. The apostle Paul writes this and says, the same closeness that Jesus had with God the Father is the same closeness that you have. You can call him Abba. Isn't that amazing? You can have the same close relationship with God the Father that Jesus and God the Father enjoyed. Why? Because the spirit of adoption moved in and he longs to hear from you. He longs to hear from you. He is the perfect father. When I was a little kid growing up, we used to brag about our dads on the playground. Maybe you did this. My dad can beat up your dad. My dad's better than your dad. Well, there's no dad better than this dad. He is completely powerful. Anything he wants to do, he does. He commands the wind and the waves. He is sovereign and knows all things. He sees the future. There's no one better than this dad. He knows every detail about you, yet he loves you more than anyone else loves you, which is staggering because when someone gets closer to me and they find details out about me, they tend to like me less. Jesus knows everything about me and he loves me more than anyone loves me. This is how good of a father he is. And this father wants to hear from you. You can call him Abba. This afternoon, if Eden, my oldest, or Evie, my youngest, come to me and they call me Dr. Geiger, you may say, well, that's respectful. No, it's not. Or if they say, Pastor Eric, oh, that's respectful. No, it's not. I want them to call me dad. And he wants you to call him dad too. He wants to have a close, intimate relationship with you. He hears you. He hears you. All right, here's number three. He assures you. Look at this next verse, verse 16. Now, I want you to notice as you read verse 16 in your Bible, you're going to notice that the first spirit is catalyzed and the second spirit is lowercase. And why is that important? Because the first spirit refers to the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit of God, who moved into your life when you became a Christian. And notice the second spirit is lowercase because that refers to your spirit. Not the Holy Spirit. So the Spirit himself, he doesn't delegate this, but the Spirit himself does this. The Holy Spirit himself testifies together with our spirit that we are God's children. He assures us. This is beautiful. You receive the spirit of adoption, and this spirit constantly reminds you that you're his. You're going through a difficult time? You're mine, he says. You're following Jesus because those of us who are Christians, we are led by God's Spirit. It doesn't mean we're perfect. We're going to fall over and over again. I fall, I stumble. And when you fall and stumble, the Spirit inside of you reminds you you're mine. He picks you up. He reminds you you're mine. He assures you. As a dad for the last eight, nine years, the typical bedtime routine for me and my daughters has been tucking Eden in bed and then Evie in bed and saying this with them. Eden, does daddy love you because you obeyed your mom today? And I've I've taught them what to say in return. No, no, daddy doesn't love, why does daddy love, daddy does not love you because you obeyed mom today. I'm glad you obeyed mom. I want you to obey mom, but that's not why daddy loves you. Does daddy love you because you tried really hard at school today? No, I want you to try really hard 
I want you to work hard. Geigers work hard. It's what we do. But Daddy doesn't love you because you worked hard. Does Daddy love you, Eden, because you're pretty? No, I think you're the prettiest third grade girl I've ever seen in my life, but Daddy doesn't love you because you're pretty. Eden, why does Daddy love you? And I've taught her to say, he loves me because he loves me. Yes, that's why I love you. And who else loves you that way? God. God loves you that way. And you can rest tonight knowing he loves you, not because of anything you've done, but just because he is love. And the spirit of God who's moved in assures us over and over again that we are his children. And this is just not my kids that need this. I need this. I've been here about eight months, and this past week, as I was preparing this message, I realized how much I need this. This was the first week since I've been here where I just felt like I, I, I bit off more than I can chew. I attempted to do too much. This was too crazy of a week, too hectic of a week, and I'm driving home one night, overwhelmed with everything I'm trying to pull off. And the Spirit, Holy Spirit, testifies with my spirit, and God essentially says to me, Eric, are you doing all these things because you think I'm gonna love you more? I already approve of you. You're already my son. You're already mine. And so many times, even those of us who preach the good news of Jesus, we can get caught in this rat race where we do things thinking the more we do, the more we're going to impress God. And God's not impressed with the things that we do for him. He wants us to just rest in his love for us and do those things not to flag him down, but because we're overwhelmed that his spirit testifies with our spirit that we belong to him, Amen. that we're his. All right, lastly. He shares his inheritance with you. And this is the next verse. Verse 17, and if children also heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. Staggering verse, right? God owns everything. He owns everything. This verse says he shares everything he has with his son. He should. The father shares all he has with the son, with Jesus. And then this verse says that we are co-heirs with Jesus, that everything Jesus has, he shares with us. He shares his inheritance with us. Some of you are going to get hooked up with an inheritance here on this earth by your earthly dad. Some of you are getting absolutely nothing. <laughs> but if you are his son or his daughter, he shares his inheritance with you. You're gonna one day pass from this life and enter into everlasting life as his son and daughter and everything that he has, he shares with you. Why? Because you are his and you've received the spirit of adoption by whom you cry out, Abba, that's my dad, that's my dad. So Jesus, while he was here, while he walked this earth, he referred to God as Abba except for one time. Do you remember the one time that Jesus did not call the Father Abba? He was on the cross. And as he was on the cross, the scripture teaches us that he was taking into his flesh all of our sinfulness. He was taking all of my foolishness, all of my pride, all of my anger, all of my lust, Jesus took it all. He took all of my sin upon himself and all of your sin upon himself. It's the darkest day in human history. It's the most sinful moment in human history as all of our sin is put on the God-man himself, on Jesus himself. And as he's on the cross bearing my sin and my shame, he doesn't call the Father Abba because God is holy and pure and he can't stand sin, he can't taste sin, he can't look upon sin. So in that moment, God the Father and God the Son aren't enjoying the intimate relationship that they enjoyed every other moment that Jesus walked this earth. In that moment, Jesus doesn't cry out, Abba. He cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
Because in that moment on the cross, Jesus was being condemned for our sins so that therefore there is now no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. On the cross, on the cross, Jesus was rejected so that you would never be rejected. On the cross, Jesus was disapproved and cursed, the Scripture says, by the Father so that you would always be approved. On the cross, Jesus cannot say Abba so that for the rest of your life you can call Him Abba. You are now His son and now his daughter, and Jesus went through all of that so that you would be adopted and he could share his inheritance with you. This is how good the good news of Jesus is. So we have received. We have received the Spirit, and the Spirit we've received is the Spirit of adoption. Maybe you're here and you're wondering, okay, I, I'm in. I, I want to be, be adopted by God. And you need to understand that while we all are created in the image of God, not all of us are sons and daughters of God. Only those of us who say, yes, I believe in you, Jesus. I receive your forgiveness. I believe, I trust you. I want to be adopted by you. Those of us who receive him, we are his sons and his daughters. Romans chapter 10, verse 9 says this, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved, forgiven, rescued, adopted. You will be adopted as his if you will receive him, if you will believe in him. So last night and at our nine o'clock service, We've had dozens of people who, for the first time, have stood up and said, I'm in. I believe. I believe in you, Jesus. I want to receive your forgiveness. Just as my daughters, one in the back seat after a Chick-fil-A drive through and one in a hotel room knelt down and said, Jesus, I believe in you. I believe in you. And the whole trajectory of their life changed. They have a better father now because I'm not the perfect father, but they have God as their forever father. So I want to give you an opportunity this morning. And I'm going to ask us to be as still as we can in this moment, because it is a sacred and special moment. If you are ready to receive his forgiveness for the first time and become his daughter, his son, his adopted child. Here's what we do at Mariners. You can stand up. We're gonna invite you to stand up right where you are and say, I believe. And here's what you're saying. Jesus, I believe that you are who you say you are, that you came here and you put yourself on a cross to die in my place. And all my sin is on you, Jesus. And so I... I I give you all my sin and I give you my life and I believe in you and I receive your forgiveness. I believe in you and I receive your forgiveness. So what we do here, and we don't do it many times a year, but several times a year we take a moment and allow you to stand up in front of a group of people. And you're like, there's a lot of people in here. There's a lot of people in here. But marriages aren't private. Births aren't private, we tell everybody. Adoptions aren't private, we tell everybody, and your adoption into the kingdom of heaven, it's not a private thing. It is a big deal. It is a beautiful moment when you become his son or you become his daughter. And so are you ready to say, Jesus, I believe, I believe in you. If so, I'm gonna invite you just to stand and say, I believe, and here's what we, we believe happens when you do that, that the Spirit of God, when you place your faith in Him, that the Spirit of God moves in and you receive His forgiveness. You're like, some of you are thinking, but I gotta, what do I have to do? What do I have to do? Isn't there a whole bunch of things I have to do? Listen, the orphan in Rome who was adopted didn't have to do anything but go home with the dad. 
There's nothing for you to do but to say, yes, pick me up. I want you to be my father. I believe in you. That's what it takes to become his son, to become his daughter. So are you ready to believe in him? If so, we're gonna give a couple moments and you'll just stand and say, I believe. I believe. I believe. Yes, it's good. Amen. Love it. Love it. Anybody else? Awesome. Love it, man. Hey, let's hold our applause so we can hear everybody. I love it. Everybody's applauding, but let's, let's hold our applause. I love it. Awesome. Anybody else? You're breaking the rules. Hold the applause. All right, say again, sir. Believes? Awesome. Anybody else? So good. Yes. Yes. Awesome. Awesome. Great. Awesome. Yes. Thank you, brother. Awesome. Great, man. Awesome. So good. Great. Awesome. God bless you. Amen. Yes. Great. I believe. Awesome. I believe. Awesome, man. Love it. John 1, 12. But to all who did receive him, he gave them the right to be children of God to those who believe in his name. To those who believe, he gives us the right to be children of God. Anybody else? Awesome, so good, great. So good, great. Good. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Let's rejoice with those who have received Jesus today. Yeah. Let's stand and let's sing and rejoice over the fact that we are no longer slaves, we are no longer orphans, but we are his adopted sons and daughters. Let's sing and celebrate this truth. Say I'm no longer a slave to fear 
common theme in culture is, I want a close relationship with my dad. It's a good desire. The Father we all need is our Heavenly Father, and He loves us more than anyone else has ever loved us, and He loves you. He loves you. He doesn't just tolerate you. He loves you. He rejoices over you with singing, the Scripture says. He's adopted you. Rest in that, enjoy that. Today, earlier, if you stood up and said, I believe, we're so excited for you, we want to let you know what we want you to do next. We have a welcome center right out to side to the left, and we would love for you to stop by there. We have some people there that have a gift they want to give you, and we just want to rejoice with you for this major commitment. We also have baptisms happening right after our service in the lake, and if you're here and you're already registered and signed up to be baptized, you'll just go there and we'll get you signed in. If you're here and you became a Christian today and you said, I believe, to the first time today, and you're like, I want to get baptized today, we have shorts and shirts for you and towels, and we'll get you baptized today, all right? And so we're ready. 
We actually had, had people last night who, who became Christian last night and said, I'm, I want to do this now. And we're like, let's do it now. The, um, the baptism last night I got in, it was freezing because the heater wasn't working. Um, it's working today, I understand. It's working today, so it's good news. If you're here and you would like someone to pray with you about anything going on in your life, we have a team of people right to my left, your right, right there by those lights. They'd love to pray with you. We also have elder prayer. These are for those of you who would like prayer for healing, whether that's physical healing, emotional, or spiritual healing, to get to the elder prayer room through the doors in the back and take a right. Let's extend our hands and receive God's blessing as we go. Father, these are your adopted sons and daughters. And you say in your word that your spirit, the spirit we've received, testifies with our spirit. So I pray this brand new week that your spirit that dwells within each son and daughter in this room would remind them over and over again this week that they belong to you. That you would fill them this week with your peace that transcends all understanding. That they would enjoy the freedom of walking not as a slave this week, but as a son and as a daughter of the great king. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Have a great week.